there were some smaller races as well in, in Texas and in Alabama. The pro-crypto candidates there were also, they came out victorious. So it's been a pretty exciting day for, for crypto and sort of really the curtain raiser for what this industry, how it can have an effect and an impact in these coming elections. This content is brought to you by BitGo, which is one of the top crypto custodians in the crypto industry. BitGo works with many big companies and brands, such as Pantera Capital, Bitstamp, and Bitcoin IRA. Nike also selected BitGo to power its wallets for its NFTs. And BitGo has many great services, such as hot wallets, custodial wallets, self-managed cold wallets, and NFT wallets. Many institutions trust BitGo with its top-level security and incredible services, such as being able to deploy your capital while it's in custody, which includes lending, borrowing, trading, staking, DeFi access, and more. If you'd like to learn more about BitGo, please visit bitgo.com, link in the description. Welcome to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Eleanor Turret, who's a journalist and producer at Fox Business. Ellie, welcome back. Thanks, Tony. Great to be here again. Ellie, uh, I'm excited to speak with you because obviously you've got your finger on the pulse of everything happening with crypto as it relates to regulations, politics, and much more. I would love to start with candidates who have aligned themselves to Elizabeth Warren kind of finding themselves behind in the elections. And then we're going to segue to John Deaton versus Elizabeth Warren. But what are you hearing about these elections? Yeah, so... Crypto is starting to have an impact. And I think a lot of people in the industry were a little skeptical at first early on whether cryptos would be crypto's election, right? Whether they could really, as a whole, come together and, and influence these, these elections, not just the presidential election, that's that's a tough one to influence, but but really influence these congressional elections, right? Congressional Senate, uh, these open seats that that some uh, candidates are trying to flip, right? And um, and we saw that. We really did see that with Super Tuesday. So I put an, out an article on Monday just covering the the three races that crypto industry was following. And when I see the crypto industry, I'm talking about the Stand with Crypto Alliance, which was helped. It was helped started by Coinbase. It's an advocacy group, and I think it's got over like 310,000 members now across the country. And and crypto voters, they're going to vote with their wallets. And and we're seeing them do that. There's a Fair Shake pack, which is um, a super pack, which has raised over $90 million in the first quarter to fund campaign, not not directly fund campaigns, because I learned that super PACs actually can't, you know, donate specifically to to individual candidate campaigns, but they can spend money on ad campaigns. And that's exactly what they did in this California Senate race between it was four contendants, um, but the two front runners were Adam Schiff, who's a Democratic congressman, and Katie Porter, who is a Democratic congresswoman. And it turned out that on Super Tuesday, crypto came out, showed up for the vote. Adam Schiff, surprisingly, he's a he's a very progressive liberal guy. He was involved in the whole sort of Trump um, Russia thing early on this the dossier, if you guys remember all that stuff. He is actually very pro digital asset innovation. I think because a lot of it, uh, a lot of the business in California, you know, it, it's made up of of people in the blockchain industry, um, tech professionals, and and people who generally believe that that crypto, blockchain, and innovation around those things are are an important part of the future, and it gives Californians jobs. So, Adam Schiff has been very vocal about fair regulation around digital assets to to keep the industry alive for the people of California. So um, Sam with Crypto has been backing him um, and Fairshake has been not donating to his campaign, but they launched a $10 million ad campaign against his opponent, Katie Porter, wow. who is a Warren protege. And I what I mean by that is she she's a Warren fan. I think they're friends. She took Warren's Harvard Law class uh, a few years ago and she kind of sides with her on things sort of anti-crypto related. She signed on to the 2022 um, investigation that, that Laura, uh, Warren launched against the Bitcoin mining industry. So, she, you know, she's, she's not insanely anti-crypto like Warren is, but she's definitely a Warren ally. And, and the crypto industry was worried that if she she got the vote over Adam Schiff, if she, you know, was was going to take Dianne Feinstein's seat in California, the late Dianne Feinstein, who was on the, on her chair for 30 years, 
that this might just give Elizabeth Warren another ally in Washington, an anti-crypto ally. So all this to say that Super Tuesday, crypto showed up. Adam Schiff has has defeated Katie Porter and uh, will be going through to the uh, the the November election, whether it's whether it's him, whether it's his Republican counterpart, we'll have to see what happens in November. But the point is, Katie Porter is out, and and that was that was Stan with Crypto's goal, Fair Shake's goal. It's been really interesting to watch. And then there were some smaller races as well in in Texas and in Alabama. The pro crypto candidates there were also they came out victorious. So it's been a pretty exciting day for for crypto and sort of uh, really the curtain raiser for what this industry, how it can have an effect and an impact in these coming elections. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exciting to hear. And I guess my first major takeaway there is that a Democrat supporting crypto, and it's not all Democrats are anti-crypto. So that's an important note. Right. Um, and actually, they were all Democratic primaries. So the 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 Schiff race, the Senate primary race, the Alabama and the Texas race, all Democrats. So I think we are, to your point, starting to see more of a shift to it's not just Republicans in uh, in Congress anymore. It's, you know, it's these these younger candidates who are coming up, tech savvy candidates who who see the potential in this technology. So did Elizabeth Warren really screw up here because she could have taken the neutral standpoint and and call for regulations, put a lot of pressure for regulations. But she took the I hate this thing. I'm against it. Here's my anti crypto army. And now attorney John Deaton, of course, is running against her for her seat. Um, What do you think? here? Do you think she dropped the ball here? I know she's got Genser in her back pocket and they're doing their thing behind the scenes there. But from a public optics standpoint, you got the entire industry against you now. Yeah. Yep, she's she's cho- chosen a formidable opponent, not just in the form of John, but also in the form of the crypto industry, because she's she's really alienated everybody, everybody from business owners to industry trade groups. Everybody knows that Elizabeth Warren, her name is now synonymous with with anti crypto, right? The anti crypto army, and yeah, I, I think it's it's definitely going to hurt her cause, whether. You know, it's crypto is not a kitchen table issue, obviously, in a in an election in Massachusetts. Right. You've got lots of different issues that would trump that as, you know, border crisis and and rising debt and student loans, all that kind of stuff that that people care about during elections and, and things that they vote for. Even John himself has admitted that crypto is not a kitchen table issue, but de facto because of his work on the on the Ripple case um, as XRP's uh, amicus curiae, um, his his speaking up for the industry, speaking out against the SEC and, and government overreach, he's de facto got the entire industry behind him. And, and we see that now with with donations from from big players like Charles Hoskinson. He he donated to his campaign and said he was fully behind him. Uh, Caitlin Long, I don't know if she's donated, but she's she's definitely supporting him. He shows up to these events like ETH Denver, right? This this yeah. this conference uh, out in out in Colorado that that is solely uh, dedicated to not just ETH but just like decentralization, DeFi, the future of Web three, all that fun stuff. Like he really showed up and, and sort of made his presence known. So while you know crypto might not be the issue he's campaigning on, he's got this support around him, and Elizabeth Warren does not. So and also I think John has good. Uh, you know, you've read his book. His yeah. his memoir was was fascinating. He comes from he really comes from nothing, right? He grew up incredibly poor. He fought for everything he has now. Put himself through through college and through law school and and uh, the Marines. So you know, uh, he said this publicly: like no one fights harder than me. No one works harder than me. So I think there's a lot that people can relate to John on. And when they see Elizabeth Warren now, it's I mean, I think she kind of started out as, as sort of similar. And there was an article that came out with sort of compared the two as champions for the underdog, right? Because they've they've been through things in their lives. But but I think John is is relatable to to people not just on these, you know, um these everyday people issues, but also on the crypto issues. And and as we see now, crypto really is using this election to make its voice heard. So it's all very interesting. I didn't think it would be quite this right. impactful. We would be talking that much about crypto in these elections, but, but we are. Yeah, it's fascinating, right? Um, and I, I'm curious to see if the Biden administration, seeing the SEC taking losses, seeing the bad optics around Elizabeth Warren, is going to pivot and maybe push through stablecoin regulations. I don't know if that's going to happen, but do you think there's a chance of that? 
I think stable regu- stable coin regulation, excuse me, it just makes sense. Um, I think, you know, it's not like it's not like this monumentous like market structure build. I think the fit for the 21st century act is where it really is getting into the nitty gritty of who's going to have jurisdiction over digital assets. Will it be the SEC? Will it be the CFTC? Will it be a combination of both? Like there's so much to go into that market structure bill that it's, it's, I think it will prove to be difficult to pass. I think stable coins are a little bit of a different story and there's things to be said for, for both sides of the argument, right? Like mm-hmm. if you're pro crypto, then you probably will be in favor of this, this, this stable coin bill um, or at least a, of having a framework around them be it would be in your best interest for them to to pass it but even right. if you're kind of skeptical on crypto you've got the argument that you know stable coins because they're pegged to the dollar would help you know with that dollar dominance that i think you know people who are a little skeptical of crypto are like oh i like my gold this trump's one of those people right like i like my dollars <laughs> like i love i love the dollar so like you know stable coin legislation will help prop that up so i think you know there's merits on both sides here so I think it's possible. I think, you know, uh, people say, well, another four years of Biden uh, really hurt the crypto industry. And 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 someone made a great point. And I can't remember who it was, but I, I really liked it. And this person, maybe it was Scaramucci. I think it was Anthony Scaramucci. He said, and we know he doesn't like Trump. We know he's not a Trumper. <laughs> um, but he was like, it's not, it's not Biden we really have to worry about because at the end of the day, he is sort of, you know, he's a little bit of a figurehead, (laughs) putting it nicely. Um, And, you know, people like Gary Gunzer at the SEC, Elizabeth Warren in the Senate there, they're sort of the ones pulling the the progressive agenda string. So what we have to worry about, and this is what Anthony said, he's like, if Biden gets in again, another four years, he's like, he's like, I'd rather that than another couple years of Elizabeth Warren. So, you know, you've got these very influential people behind the scenes who, who, you know, between the November election and then the 2026 midterms, you know, crypto could make a difference in those votes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm just fascinated by this and I'm watching it closely, how uh, crypto is just seeping into the political realm. And it, would you had all these um, uh, on the Republican side, look, even Democrat, RFK Jr., even though he went independent, many of these political candidates were giving their crypto ideas and strategies and that they were for it. That, that blew me away. Vivek, Ron DeSantis and all these guys. I, I didn't see that coming. No, no. And I think you saw sort of a rallying point around the anti-CBDC rhetoric, right? You know, you mm-hmm. saw that from Vivek, Ron DeSantis, RFK. I think that, even though it's not, you know, a CBDC is not, you know, crypto specifically, it's it's sort of like, you know, it's a, it's a part of what crypto is, a part of what digital money could be if we incorporate the Fed. But but that's even even that is is bringing crypto into the conversation. If you talk about a CBDC, you have to talk about digital the digitization of money and then that brings in bitcoin it brings in everything else so so yeah i think we kind of saw the the sort of the um it it get its way in there through the cbd anti-cbdc conversation and we've obviously seen senators hop on board with that even congressmen we've got uh, bills from uh, tom emmer in the house and bills from ted cruz um in the senate so you know anti-cbdc we're never going to allow this to happen i think trump came out recently and said it was very dangerous and not a good not a good thing to allow the government to be in control of, right? So it's got this surveillance angle. You've got others who say it's inevitable, it's going to come, like money is being digitized, the Fed is eventually going to, you know, have a digital dollar. But right. it's, uh, it's, a, it's a process, obviously. Um, it's just been interesting how, yes, how, like you said, it's been incorporated into the conversation of politics. Yeah. And I'm hoping this year um, they can get something through. I know we just talked about the stablecoin bill. I know Patrick McHenry wants to get those two bills out of the house, but as usual, government sometimes it just trips its own self up, right? It can, it can get out of its own way. There's so many things happening. Let's talk shape shift. What, what, what do you think about that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we saw the SEC come out yesterday with a cease and desist against Shapeshift. So Eric Voorhees, I believe, is the founder of Shapeshift. Mm-hmm. And what I thought was interesting about that is they they go back to 2014, right, when this exchange, which it was at the time, started operating and, and selling what they say are unregistered securities. I don't believe they specified which ones, which tokens were securities in this one, because Shapeshift has agreed to settle and and not you know admit wrongdoing here. So we didn't find out what the tokens were, but it's the same thing as what they're going after Coinbase for, what they're going after Kraken for, Binance, 
it's it's the unregistered broker dealer selling unregistered securities. So that wasn't really a shock, but I was I was interested to see that they went after them for you know the period of 2014 to 2021 because in 2021 Shapeshift changed its changed its model. They're no longer a broker dealer acting as a broker dealer, right? Whether they're registered or not. So so that kind of like opened up my mind to the like to thinking, okay, maybe the SEC could go back and, and prosecute something or bring up something from that time frame. So, you know, let's let's talk about all the uh Eastgate people that are probably gonna be watching this. You know, does that mean the SEC can go back and say, oh, the Ethereum ICO in 2020, uh, 2014, excuse me, you know, could could that be fair game? So, you know, I know that they shapeshift wound down in 2021 and it's now 2024 so like the statute of limitations like maybe they were able to do it because it was still within that time frame but but i know the the ETH gate people are gonna be like oh well you know there's precedent now that they went back and said between 2014 and 2021 so that's kind of like where my brain is at just because you know yeah. that is what you know we've been seeing a lot of on on x but i mean if you think about shapeshift in general, like it's not, what was it? It was a $215,000 fine. Like that's a speeding ticket literally for, for a company. Like, you know, they don't have to admit wrongdoing. So it was just the SEC saying, all right, ding, move on. So, you know, really there was no, there was no harm, no foul here because they didn't admit any wrongdoing. And the SEC said, all right, just, you know, pay the fine and move on. Yeah. It's so strange. Um, one to your point of retroactively going, go, going after them, you know, the, Hey, you did this back in this year. It's like, what the hell is that? So I feel like it's Gary trying to scramble for wins here because if he's taking bigger losses, right. Um, with, uh, obviously the grayscale situation, the ripple lawsuit, uh, and debt box, they're getting scolded by the judge. And it seems like they're just trying to scramble for wins here, but, this, this seems so silly. I mean, the, the, it's not the same business model anymore. So I don't understand what's going on. Um, but with that said, uh, regarding ETHgate and so forth, I, I don't necessarily think this sets any precedence because the SEC we've seen, they make it up as they go many times, right? They'll, they'll pivot and change. Look, Gary Genser doesn't repeat what Jay Clayton and Bill Hinman said. Why, why, why do we, we right? Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. And and there's a lot of stores set by this statute of limitations. Can you go after a company after a certain amount of years have passed? But, you know, maybe the SEC can just play by their own rules, because I think I'm not sure if it's criminal or if it's civil, like if that changes the statute of limitations time frame, if something is like fraud or not, I believe it. I believe it is. But yeah, I mean, I think basically, to your point, the SEC does sort of just make up their own rules as they go and, and say, hey, we're going to you know, do what we think is good for us. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, there's really no rhyme or reason logic around yeah. it. Right. And mm -hmm. then we're seeing um, in the Kraken case, I was actually surprised by this, the eight state attorney generals coming in, um, while they didn't specifically endorse Kraken, they are highlighting that this is a, a mess what the SEC is doing. Um, and then I don't know how that helps, if it helps Coinbase's case, but look, Kraken and Coinbase are both you know, uh, filing for a motion to dismiss. Um, what are your thoughts on these major exchanges fighting back and, and the Kraken situation? Yeah, it's been really interesting to watch. Kraken was dinged by the SEC, I believe it was December. So we know Coinbase has been in this process for a little while. Kraken, and I always call them like the silent killers, right? They're very sort of under the radar and they don't make a lot of headlines. They kind of just get on with stuff and 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 do what it is, whatever it is they do, operate as a as a crypto exchange. But there's really not any like waves being made. So when the SEC came after them, it's like, all right, well, you know, kind of predictable because of the same thing as as Coinbase, the same thing as Binance without the fraud stuff. Um, and yeah, so it's it's it wasn't surprising, but I was shocked to. I guess when you put the whole thing together on the in the time frame of like you know you see all these companies sort of it's a concerted effort it's not just like one random company it's not just ripple anymore right so we yeah. kind of started with ripple they were the ones who stood up and said all right we're gonna we're gonna fight back against the sec but now in 2024 you've got at least three exchanges doing that you've got yeah. the bitcoin miners down in texas uh, yeah. pushing back against the energy department for this what they say was an unlawful survey or at least an unlawful unlawful attempt to get information uh on their energy consumption so 
and and a judge came out and said, yes, we, you know, we'll, we'll grant you that temporary restraining order because we think you, you know, have merits for this case. And then the two parties came to an agreement that said, all right, we won't issue the survey without the proper guardrails in place, right? They were kind of circumventing congressional uh, procedure that would allow them to get this information. So, you know, from, from people I've been talking to, they think that the EIA, the Energy Information Association Agency, one of the two A's, will be yeah. back. They will, it, they'll be back. They'll, because they have yeah. right to collect this kind of information. It's just the way in which they went about it. The emergency fashion, the, 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 the justification for doing what they did just didn't square in the eyes of a judge. So, you yeah. know, probably going to see another survey request maybe sometime in the future, but obviously there's a lot of uh, stuff that has to happen before that. So all that to say, like, it's just been so interesting to watch crypto stand up for itself. And, wow. and, you know, I reached out to the SEC for comment in for that article. And I just said, you know, hey, guys, like writing a story about uh, crypto companies pushing back, challenging the SEC in court. And, uh, and the comms guy comes back to me and he's like, well, you know, like we are the ones that sued them first. Like they're not suing us. Like we, you know, we're they're and we're challenging them. And I'm like, I'm like, yes, but you know what I mean? Like, they're not just laying down and saying, okay, SEC, you're right. We're wrong. We're actually going to, you know, we're going to take this to court and we're going to see, you know, how we can, how we can fight this out in a, in a judicial setting. So yeah, it's it's so interesting and all the different examples. And when you really lay them out and and look at them all from a thirty thousand foot view, you're like, wow, like this this is a concerted industry effort to be heard and and to not feel like they're being unfairly prosecuted anymore. Yeah, absolutely. And there was even a smaller case uh, coming out of Texas. I think the, the, the exchange name is Legilex or Legit yeah. Exchange, and and some other advocacy group. And the name escapes me, but they. All of a sudden came out of nowhere and say, hey, SEC, tell us what the hell is going on. What's the security? Yep. What's not? Is secondary sales a security or not? And it's amazing. I love that the industry is coming together, standing up, because it's like you got to stand up to the bully sometime, right? And, or you're yeah. going to keep getting pushed down. So, And in uh, that case, that case, that was the Legilex company coming out and suing the SEC. That was not a SEC suing Legilex and then pushing back on it like, like has been the case in in uh, Kraken and Coinbase. So, so yeah, I was like, well, that's, that's an example, number one. And then obviously number two, the EIA was not suing Riot platforms. They chose to sue the energy department. So, you know, it is, it's reciprocated from these companies that are getting targeted, but it's also just companies that are just sick of it and want clarity. And they're like, we're going to use the courts because that seems to be the only way that we can, we can get answers. Mm. Let's talk about Ripple. Um, I know there's, if I'm not mistaken, trial coming in April. Is that right? And are you hearing yeah. anything new there? Um, so nothing new per se. I think really what this all comes down to now is is how Ripple is going to pay, I guess, pay for what they did wrong, <laughs> pay for their institutional sales of of what the judge found to be securities when it was sales of XRP to institutions. So the, as far as that goes, that's sort of the the only hurdle that's left. However, that being said, don't forget that the SEC did try to uh, file an emergency appeal of sorts. Uh, what was that word that we all kept using and we got so good at saying for a while? In, um, and, interlocutory. Uh, yes. uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I perfected saying that word because I said it so many times at the time. But the interlocutory appeal to to get the judge to say, you know, halt the masses we're gonna we're gonna go back and we're gonna review this decision about the secondary market sales so uh the S she said no the, the judge said the sec has to go around and, and wait for the trial to be over wait for the proceedings all to be done and i think they're going to do that i do think they're probably going to appeal when everything is done and dusted so i don't think we've seen even with the april stuff and 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 how long that all takes to hash out i think the sec will probably still appeal the secondary market sales because I think they still think they're in the right. So who knows how long that part of it could go on for. And could also, Ellie, do you think it's an optics thing that if they do capitulate here, right, and say, oh, okay, all right, let's settle this down, it gives more ammo to the rest of the industry. You say, oh, okay. <laughs> all right? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Because then you you really got the commission sort of adhering to Judge Torres's ruling that secondary market sales on exchanges between anonymous investors, retail investors are not securities. And, 
And I think that is a dangerous precedent for the SEC to, to set if they continue down this path of just regulation by enforcement for not registering, because really, who knows what what is the security and what is not? There's no legislation that says one way or the other. So it's just, it's a continuous cycle of just confusion and and that broad scope. You know, the SEC likes to keep things broad so they can bring enforcement cases down the line if they need to. So yeah, I, I think it does give the industry ammo if they if they sort of don't don't appeal. Mm. Now, speaking of securities, um, Gary Genser, we know, refuses to echo the statements of Jay Clayton and Bill Himmon about Ethereum. And, and and this was even before Congress, right? Patrick McHenry asking him about these things. Do you think they will approve the Ethereum spot ETFs at the May 23rd deadline? So I've, from my reporting, a lot is changing around this narrative. So I think, mm-hmm. so an, an, an short space of time as well. So I'm judging my sort of feeling about it based on the issuers I speak to and the engagement from SEC staff. So what I learned with the Bitcoin spot ETFs is that the SEC staff started, I mean, it was really after the grayscale win, right? We saw the SEC staff start to engage with issuers on the on the content of their S1s and their 19B4s. So when they start doing that, that's sort of a good sign that they are, you know, saying, all right, we'll put in a good faith effort to to maybe get these on the market. It's March 6th, and that was it May 23rd deadline, you said? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's really only two months away. And if you think about once Grayscale won, I think it was like around August, September, right? So, September, October, November, December, January. February. So, it was longer than two months it took for the SEC to really hash out the, the contents of those applications. And I think it's going to take them longer to than just two months for Ethereum, especially because it's not the same product as Bitcoin. It's it's different. Mm-hmm. You've got you know you've got that staking aspect in there as well. You've also got the conundrum of whether Ethereum is a security or not. Is is Gensler going to come out and say what he's thinking anytime soon? Like I think oh, like so much has to happen between now and and that May deadline. So um, just from what I'm hearing, and I don't want to like make a prediction or like give my like odds on it. Cause I, I always get nervous when I, when I'm asked to do that, but mm-hmm. I think the the odds are coming down. So when I was in mm-hmm. Miami for the, uh, for the ETF conference, there was a lot of positivity. I think it was just, cause it was kind of right at the beginning of February. It was like, everyone was still sort of on that high after the Bitcoin spots were approved. All the, most of the issuers were actually at this conference. We saw grayscale. Yeah. Uh, Galaxy, they were all there touting their product, telling investors how we told you so. We knew this would work, and and you know there's been great flows, and everything is dandy. So I think a lot of the optimism stemmed from that, and now I think it's kind of coming down to the fact that all right, we are in March, and the SEC, from what I've heard anyway, has not really been engaging on the on the um, applications. So I guess we'll see. I mean, and I always say this, at the end of the day, it comes down to to what Gary Gensler is feeling, what he wants. He was the deciding vote for approving those Bitcoin spots. So, you know, maybe he's made up his mind and, and you know, we'll, we'll tell the staff, you know, at the end of March to, to get it done in a month. Who knows? But I think it's unlikely. Yeah. And look, I, I don't know, maybe him and Elizabeth Warren are going to be t- still die on that hill, right? Let's d- delay it. And then they're willing to go to court, but who knows? Now, Larry Fink of BlackRock has visited your office and in the studio and interviewed by Charles and so forth. Did he say anything? <laughs> well, he, I think this was the same interview where Charlie asked if, yeah. if BlackRock was interested in an XRP ETF. And Larry was like, you don't want me to answer that. And <laughs> so, so he's the only thing he said to us is that. BlackRock does have an application for an Ethereum spot ETF in with the SEC, and he didn't comment on Gensler or anything like that and and the odds of it. But let's pull back and look at the influence that BlackRock has had. I mean, if you look at the performances of the Bitcoin spot ETFs out of the, I think it was 11 that launched, but I think nine or nine are always sort of in the nine are doing well, right? Nine are sort of in the in the eye of at least Eric and James. They always talk about the new nine mm-hmm. and how well they're doing. But but BlackRock is leading that. Grayscale is obviously the incumbent, um, but BlackRock is like 
I mean, every day I feel like they hit new records, like yeah. massive inflows, massive volume, like that BlackRock holds over like a billion of Bitcoin now. And, and it's only been a month. So these numbers are just just incredible. And so I think based on performance alone, based on investor appetite, we know that big wirehouses, um, other broker dealer platforms, they're they're getting more and more interested as they see these the performance of these of these ETFs and maybe the merits of offering them to clients. There's there's appetite there. So I think between that, between Larry Fink's support, it's gonna happen. Is it gonna happen in the next two months? I don't know. But it's it's definitely something that that the market wants. And I think at the end of the day, we've even heard and we heard Hester Peirce say that. She said we shouldn't be sort of the the gatekeepers on on giving the public what they want to invest in, right? We we need to be in charge of disclosures and, and making sure that investors have all the information at their fingertips before they put their money in, but but we shouldn't be the ones to to put a stop to it if that's what people want to invest in. Yeah, absolutely. Final question here for you. I saw you tweeted about Custodia Bank versus the Fed, that there is possibly some sort of resolution coming there. Uh, what can you tell us there? Yep. So this one was kind of new for me, too, because when I wrote my article about crypto pushing back, I knew what was going on with Custodia and how they were suing the Fed. And, and I didn't really know the specifics. So when I read about it, I was like, wow, like, you know, it's not every day that, that a little bank in Wyoming goes after, uh, goes after the what the the U.S. Central Bank, right? The Federal right. Reserve. So <laughs> just a quick rundown for anybody who doesn't know, basically, Custodia applied to get banking services through the Kansas City Fed, which is a member bank of, of the big Fed. Um, and it was supposed to get a license. And it took, I think it was 19 months, they they delayed this license. They kept saying, oh, no, we need more time to, to figure it out. A process that should have taken, you know, like a third or maybe a quarter of that time. And and I think Custodia believed that is because they were their crypto friendly bank, right? They're, they they hold crypto on their balance sheets. They're, they're crypto friendly. Um, and this was all sort of going on last year as well when we saw the collapse of those crypto friendly banks. Remember Signature, Silicon Valley Bank. And, and I think the, the, the banking industry was, and the Fed especially, we saw the Fed put out bulletins to banks saying, you know, beware of crypto, beware of getting involved with with this industry because of the liquidity issues and it's just massive liability. So I think at that time that was also in the process when when Custodia was looking for that for that license. So it's like a perfect storm and 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 now I think yeah, like you said, so I um the judge yesterday put in a um a little thing in uh, in court listener or pacer or whatever it is. I'm so like up on that stuff now after the Ripple case. It's like all I look at. <laughs> um and they said that he, the judge said, you know, forthwith, I will be making a decision on summary judgment. And from covering the Ripple case, we know what that means. So basically, mm -hmm. the merits of the case are decided on facts and not it's not going to go to trial, right? It's not going to be the long drawn out trial. The Ripple case was decided on on summary judgment. So um, forthwith, that decision will be coming. So um, I actually have a I I guess I, I'll couch this with an off the record meeting um, with someone from Custodia later on today, um, just to discuss like, you know, uh, what are you feeling? How are you? Obviously no one knows, right? No one knows what the judge right. is gonna come out with, but it's all sort of, I think there's there's momentum towards the positive side because like, if you, I mean, if you look, if you're someone who doesn't even know about the case and you just sort of did like the, the 30,000 foot TLDR, you'd see like, well, what was the reason for the Fed delaying this thing for so long? And and why was the was the central bank, like the board of governors at the big Fed involved in something that was such a small issue, you know, seemingly could be figured out by the Kansas City Fed? So I think if you look at it from that point and the judge says, yep, OK, I've made a decision like you could maybe infer that that it would be a positive outcome for custodia. So we'll see. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it could come any day now. But it, again, it's just another example of crypto pushing back and 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 winning in the courts and these judges man I, I i've had this conversation with with other people too like who i'm sure they never thought they'd be inundated with crypto cases now they have to get uh, up to speed on you know like what digital assets are and and web3 and and crypto tokens and and how we oh my goodness they're all just like when is this crypto stuff gonna end <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 insane, man. What's been going on? And I hope Custodia comes out with a victory. 
Um, I have spoken to Caitlin Long quite uh, quite a few times, and you know she she was pretty upset because there was a bit of hypocrisy because it goes back to FTX and Farming State Bank and and how the Fed you know gave them the green light very quickly, and and uh, SBF got to meet with Jerome Powell and so forth. So you know you just see the bias and also. Uh, kind of the whole operation choke point and trying to stop crypto in any type of banking way. So it's crazy what's going on. But, uh, you know, as, as they say, we're there, we're in the then they fight you phase, but then you win. So, yeah, yeah. And I think I think it, this also shows we should never underestimate how much damage Sam Bankman fried really did, because yeah. as someone who was obviously in the offices of Gary Gensler, Jerome Powell, Maxine Waters, all these regulators and lawmakers, he pulled the wool pretty far over their eyes. So it's not entirely surprising that they're that they're very, very skeptical and, and nervous to engage with the industry. But at the same time, there comes a there comes a point where it's like, you know, you should be able to discern bad actors from the good. And just because this one guy screwed it up for everybody else doesn't mean that, you know, we should be regulated out of existence. So yeah, I think we can't overstate how much damage was done by FTX and SBF. Ali, always great stuff. Appreciate all your work and your content because I use it. <laughs> so thank you. For <laughs> I'm glad to hear <laughs> anytime. Thanks for having me, Tony.